to Peter Chernin, Tom Jacobson's office, everyone's there totally focused on me. I go, it's a modern day Romeo, and as soon as I say the word Juliet, he says, okay, is that uh, Romeo and Juliet by William Shakespeare with the original language? Tom is feeling like so sorry for me at this point. He leans over and he says, like talking to an accident victim, he says really encouragingly, you know, I, I, I hear there's music in it. I go, yes, yes, there's music in it. And Tom goes, what kind of music? And I go, contemporary music. And he goes, what kind of contemporary music? And I go, more hits than you can possibly imagine. And they kind of laughed. It was such a ridiculous thing to say. So we were like, yeah. We used to have these things called green light meetings, where everybody who was responsible for making and marketing a movie, or all of our movies, would sit around in the big conference room um, in the executive building and sort of, we'd throw out a movie. And the people who were its advocates, usually the development team, the movie development people, would say, this is a movie we want to make, and this is why. And they almost pitch the idea to the marketing people, the publicity people, the music people, the senior executives. And we, as a company, would sort of decide, are we going to make this movie or not? The irony of, of that green light meeting wasn't really clear to me until I saw the film. But by far and away, it was the most interesting, contentious, um, uh, energized green light meeting we ever had. I realized how absolutely ineffective words were to describe what Baz had in mind. Some people saying, this is the greatest thing we've ever seen, oh my god, this is amazing, we have to make this for only nine and a half million dollars. So when it was put out in front of us, well it's Shakespeare and it will be contemporary and it it will be with some contemporary costumes. And other people saying, nine and a half million dollars, are you crazy? We can't make a movie where people speak in Shakespearean. And it was just a great, and at the end of it, really by not much of a margin, we as a company agreed to greenlight the movie. This is my first film with a major studio. Risk. It was considered crazy, wild, it should never get made. And maybe one way, you know, that we could, uh, you know, kind of shore up our situation as if we had a hit album. knew what I was doing I probably would have quit. The plan is that there is no plan and we did stick very rigidly to that. <laughs> if the music people on Romeo and Juliet knew what they were doing they probably would have fired me. I don't think Capital really knew what they had. They really didn't. Capital was not excited about putting that much money down. It's as if we really hijacked the infrastructure and hijacked the mechanism of the studio on behalf of this little ten million dollar movie. <laughs>
he would take the music that came from the lives of the audience and use it to help tell the story. That was our mission. We had to take the music from the lives of our audience and find a way of it sitting comfortably with the language of William Shakespeare. Maybe I'm just too visual collage, written collage, sonic collage, and of course in the end, a musical collage. And Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet was set in Verona, he'd never been there, and it was a world for him that was visceral and hot and sexy and religion and politics all mixed up with each other, so he essentially created that world. It didn't take a lot of searching before we realized that the contemporary version of Shakespeare's Verona was contemporary Miami. It was everything we wanted Verona to be. The place is quite violent. The place is quite religious. The place is very sexy. A piece of music that was hugely influential on me at the time that really seemed to sum up this hyper-Miami-like world was a song called Unfinished Sympathy by Massive Attack. And it was to that track that I began to write. I can remember the, the opening treatment of Romeo and Juliet. There was also this other album I was relentlessly listening to by Bjork, and the song was Venus as a Boy. We cut our early trailers to that song and you could really literally believe that Juliet was singing to Romeo that song. What I came to discover was that these two pieces of music were connected by something. And that connection was a producer called Nellie Hooper. Nellie won't appear in this documentary because he's, he's not the kind of person who does interviews. But he is present in the film and in the documentary through the music. Baz was very much in love with the people that were making that kind of music and, and Bjork. Um, and so he kind of looked around and said, okay, I want the people that are doing this kind of stuff making the soundtrack for my film. I know that Baz uh, liked a lot of the work that Nelly had been producing, uh, like Massive Attack and Madonna. Craig, in that respect, was someone who had done a lot of orchestration. He did a lot of pop orchestration in England. I mean, he was the go-to guy for, you know, strings. If Madonna wanted strings on her album, you would hire Craig. And within Nelly's team, uh, there, there was Marius and I. Marius is a guy who was known as probably one of the best programmers in England at the time, or excuse me, in Europe at the time. And I didn't really know of him, but if you were like into dance music, into techno and stuff, you would have heard his name, at least spoken about you know, in reverential circles. Oh, you worked with Marius de Vries. It just sounded like an unlikely proposition that, that, that Nelly would be approached to do a Shakespeare film. It felt, felt like a, a category error. It was a brave and unusual thing for, for Baz to choose a production sort of team, I suppose, rather than a composer. I mean, it's a, I can't think of anybody who's really done that. But that, that's a very Baz thing to do, isn't it? He's always sort of ahead of the game, isn't he? I know that the studio weren't terribly happy about this. They'd kind of said, well, look, can't you just have an ordinary film composer that does film composing and we know we trust and it'll all be good? I'll be close. This idea of Nellie, Marius and Craig uh, was presented. And I remember thinking, once again, this sounds really interesting and adventurous. If you wanted the massive attack sound, you know, you wanted the soul-to-soul -soul vibe. These were the people you would hire. I don't think that the, the studio really knew what he was making. I don't think they actually really grasped his vision. And Baz turned up, you know, clutching big photographs and little bits of video and, and a, a script. There was a certain amount of bewilderment and scepticism uh, as an initial response to, to Baz's appearance. 
he said, you know, I, I've been asked to do this film, and he, he described meeting Baz as, you know, I suppose like when if an MD meets Baz, you know, they, 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 they always fall in love with him, don't they? So that seemed to me to be the perfect way to start a relationship, and in, in a sense encapsulated everything that was to follow, because there was a, a sort of rigorous cultural application of, you know, a phenomenal emotional intelligence to the story, coupled with a night out with some drag queens. I wanted these guys to do it, but the question was, you know, how would we do it? What would the creative process be? It's normally with a, with a score, what happens is you have a composer who writes to picture and he has a team of people around him who are used to orchestrating and laying out the whole uh, stall of, of musical instrumentation and the director looks at it and says, yeah, that's great, can you change this, can you change that? The way that Baz encouraged us to approach the music of the film was, I think, unprecedented in terms of how we were able to liberate ourselves from a conventional orchestrated score and achieve the same ends uh, using devices that I think hadn't been used before in cinema. One thing that made me very happy is that Jeff Foster was hired and he was a well-known film music guy and you know in my mind he was going to save our butts. Marius and Craig and Nelly were very much from the pop sensibility. They, they, it's like, you know, you make a record and if it takes you two weeks more to get an idea together, fine. Unfortunately, in film, you don't have another two weeks. If we'd been a bit more experienced and a bit wiser, we might have thrown our hands up and said this is going to be impossible. What about drawn among these heartless hangs? As each version of the script came out, uh, Baz would ask me to prepare another timeline to go up on the wall in the writing room and it was the timeline would have all the scenes from the script uh, along the top and we would put all the music uses uh, along the bottom of the timeline so uh, you would know if there was a song playing or whether it was score or whether it was a set piece which is singing and dancing on screen all of those things were were known as early as the writing stage it's just you don't know at that point what the songs are or what the score will sound like. Baz always used to say that he knew that, that um, the first 15 minutes of the film was crucial in that at the end of that 15 minutes you were either on board or you were overboard. Pretty quickly we came up with the idea of it being in operatic form. Now in an opera you start with an overture and in that overture you introduce a little taste of every musical theme you're going to experience throughout the rest of the story. There were no boundaries in terms of the, um, the extent of the eclecticism that we're allowing to take place. So uh, it's click, click, static, and then the mother of all sort of tape speed up noises. And a big kind of pagan oratorio, the influences for which are blatant. <laughs> With, by the way, the lyrics being a Latin translation of the prologue. Then, as you say, the, the gas station scene, a little bit of Nine Inch Nail style rock and roll, some Beastie Boys of that. The boys, the boys. Most of the fight scenes and confrontations in the movie are, are shot in a sort of manner that's deliberately reminiscent of Leone, so then obviously you have your Morricone moment.
plausible amount of action sort of sandwiched into 15 minutes. And then you see Romeo. And you have your first moment of stillness after 15 minutes of crazy intense action. And the upshot of that is that you are very, very drawn emotionally to Romeo. It's, it's in the performance, it's in the language there, but it's also to do with the fact that you've been like tossed around by this storm and suddenly, you know, there's a ray of sunlight which is a still emotional moment coming you know, through the clouds. Why then, O oh brawling love, O oh loving hate, O oh anything of nothing first create? And you're right right there with, with Romeo and you really begin to engage with the the emotional heart of the story at that point. It's not just a wind serenade, it's the opening notes of a Radiohead song, and even Tom's voice, you know, very, very background in the mix, but Tom's voice just sort of helping to set the temperature as well. Yeah. I never questioned whether that first 15 minutes would be watchable, but I think it's a sort of necessary ordeal for the audience that the film should start that way. At the time that Romeo and Juliet was produced in the mid-90s, it was the beginning of a golden age in soundtracks. As costs of films escalated, Studios were looking for ways to lessen their exposure, looking for ways to get somebody else, you know, um, to pay for some of their movie. The way we would do it is we'd go to a, a label that we felt had the appropriate roster of artists, and they had a feeling for the film, or possibly a big single tie-in with a major artist. You could probably get a, a record company to pay this much, this much, this much would depend on the movie. Um, and that would, you know, uh, offset some of the costs of, of making your film. In the case of Romeo and Juliet, Capitol Records won the bidding. Capitol was not excited about putting that much money down on a record where teenagers were going to be speaking Shakespearean. Do you buy your thumb us, sir? I do buy my thumb, sir! Do you buy your thumb at us? Sir. It was a risk. The way you market an album traditionally is you release singles, you release videos, you do all of that. Well, in order for them to do that successfully, they need cooperation from the director. Shakespeare had this hugely eclectic use of music. He, he used absolute music of the moment from the street. He totally used you know, dramatic music, church music. And we needed to use contemporary street music. We needed to bring our music from, from the streets and put it into the film, and yet it had to go into full orchestral score, big love ballads, opera, you know, it, great for storytelling, terrible for soundtrack. What I was really looking for in soundtracks and in soundtrack albums were souvenirs of the movies. Like at that time too, in the 90s, was the big inspired by thing, where it didn't, you didn't have to have music in the movie you just had to have the name of the movie and there'd be 12 songs by the hottest artist with the movie name on the record and i just couldn't stand that i mean karen had great strength i mean she really had balls and she was always about let's not go chasing hit album let's just tell the story karen was from the record company she should have been saying you know put a hit single in the movie um, but in fact, she was more about storytelling, and that was useful to us. It let us get on with the job of using music for that purpose. Oh, then I see Queen Mab has been with you. I mean, Queen Mab in the play is notoriously difficult because it's essentially this dialogue between two boys about, oh, you know, love has been with you, but it's kind of very sexual. It's about, you know, you know, Mercutio is saying to Romeo, but it doesn't mean anything. It's only chemical, you know? It's an illusion kind of not real, don't, don't get drawn down the road by it. So we hit upon the idea that if it's chemical, it's illusionary, then it was like, you know, a love drive. The, the whole Young Heart sequence, it's, it's a long stretch where, where really we're just relying on one piece of music. 
um, which was something of a luxury in the context of a film which jumps around so much. And that gave us the opportunity to take this, this one piece and, and serve it up in a number of different ways. Like a very long remix with no constraints on, in terms of the coherence of the mix itself, which you wouldn't be able to do as a record. So that was a lot of fun. We were shooting the film in Mexico City and our music team were in London. So it sort of led to lots of late nights huddled around the speakerphone reviewing the track. In those days, we didn't have email or MP3s or the internet to help us out with this. It was, <laughs> it was very basic. It was Baz with a recorder in his hand, which we would then hand over to the choreographer the next morning with the latest version of the song. We all sort of understood the, the language we were speaking and what we were aiming at. And so sometimes being that separated geographically wasn't as much of a problem as it might have otherwise been. Oh, that's great. It sounds fantastic. I mean, the good thing about this is that it's really got that, you know that thing about that early disco feel is that it's, it's tragic but it's really joyous. Yeah. I don't think it was ever the case that we would be presenting something and Baz would think, oh, they've just gone off in completely the wrong direction. You know, we would often present something and he would say, that's not good enough, do it again. But that's a different thing. Young Arts Run Free, it goes through its journey from being, you know, hands in the air, handbag, disco, and then when he takes the mythical love drugs, it goes into being a kind of rave track, and then there's a mad moment with Fulgencia Capulet that's kind of, you know, we're at a, we're at a sort of gangster's Cuban party, and then it becomes all too much, and it's wild, and it's crazy, and then, uh, Romeo. He's got his face in a bowl, and he obviously hasn't been well pulls the mask off and he collects himself. In a way you feel like he's, he's rejected that chemical love. That chemical love has come out of his body and in that moment as he begins to breathe more peacefully we hear the first few notes of the love theme because he starts to feel the presence of Juliet through the fish tank and there begins in operatic terms the song the two lovers must share together. He got a lot of songs and they just didn't hit it. And I had been on the back kind of talking to Desiree because she was an artist that at the time was hugely popular. We got two songs from her. Um, Kissing You and Swords of Love. There were two songs submitted and deciding on it was mind-numbing in a sense. I mean, we, Jill, Billcock and I just put it up against sequence after sequence. But Kissing You ended up just being better for the movie, being the right song, and it was just magic. Then Craig Armstrong began using it thematically, and you know, I mean, I really thought his orchestrations were just sublime. We talk about operatic form and you know you have the overture in the beginning where you get a taste of everything that is to come. But then you've got to set the themes. So we start with the boy theme. And then you have the girl theme. And you bring them together, and you must set a new theme, and that is the love theme. Once you've set those themes, you entwine them to continue to tell the story. And there does come a point, once the relationship between the two lovers has reached its full peak that you can no longer introduce new music. The music for the swimming pool which 
starts off with the kissing you arrangement and then goes off on its own, you know, musically. It was a big, big string orchestra. I think it was about 60 people. Just whatever happened that day and the way Jeff recorded it, it's one of the best string recordings I've ever heard. I mean, it's like 60 people playing as quietly as they can. It's a very beautiful sound, I think. We were shooting in Mexico City and the phone rings. Baz was shooting the pool scene and he was, you know, waist deep in water and, uh, you know, directing the actors. And there was a young, young man called Quindon Tarver on the phone and he had been uh, preparing an audition of, of When Doves Cry and Everybody's Free. And he actually did his audition over the phone to Baz. Everybody's free. What comes with these enormous investments of often a million dollars or more, some of these huge soundtrack deals in that period, is that the label would have the opportunity to have a big single. For the kind of money that Capital was paying for the soundtrack album for Romeo and Juliet, we were supposed to take big chunks of that money and give it to platinum artists who would give us single rights. I mean, obviously there was a lot of pressure to have big names sing tracks like Everybody's Free or Doves Cry. How can you leave I mean, in the script, Craig Pierce and I actually wrote that Doves Cry should be sung by a young Stevie Wonder. I was scared when I heard about When Doves Cry. And then when I heard it, I was really embarrassed that I was so scared because it was so amazing. In fact, we did find a young Stevie Wonder. The only thing was he sang a bit more like Aretha Franklin. One of the great joys in working in music uh, with a composer like Craig is that right up to the last moment you're still seeking what is that perfect musical solution. And it was very typical of Craig Armstrong, right up to the last moment he suddenly went like, just a second, Buzz, I've got a little something here. And out comes a dat. And on it was this 13 minute orchestral piece he had composed. And it was absolutely perfect for that entire segment of the film. And you, of course I realized in that moment what a truly remarkable composer in his own right that Craig Armstrong was. I don't know, I don't know why I played it for Baz. Probably a bit of desperation, to be honest, do you know what I mean? Well, you know, but, but, but Baz is, you know, wants to hear every combination of, 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 you know, the more the better, I think, with Baz. And so probably out of desperation, I was just pulling stuff out of my bag, saying, what do you think of that, you know? Here was this, like, 13-minute piece of music that was like this really slow adagio that had this slow burn, it's all like minor key, it just starts building and building and building and building, gets to the point. I'm like, oh yeah, this could be useful, sure. So I loaded it into the computer and I started cutting it. And it turns out it just laid in beautifully. He really liked it, and uh, that, that's the one that got used um, through the piece, and, uh, but, and lots of, sort of variations of it. And I, I remember Bad saying that he thought the summed up the sort of relationship between Romeo and Juliet, you know. In a funny sort of way, it slowed the film down, I think. Usually that's a bad thing. But, but, but it seemed to just let the film breathe a wee bit more, you know. Because it was a different kind of reality of music, you know what I mean? It was a piece that was written years ago. I mean, I don't know, probably written it like five years before. have a piece of temp score show up and become the thing itself is highly unusual. My only love sprung from my only hate. The, the one easy thing about writing film music is that a lot of it is on the screen. You know, I mean, I find these days when 
I divide myself between like more classical commissions and film. F film is easier because uh, the, the the vision of a film uh, is really the, d the director's. You know, it's his baby, and a lot of what to do is there. Really, you know, y you've almost just got to become one of the actors. I'd been working for weeks doing all these dots, right? And I did this tiny little piano thing to this scene, and Bass came in and went, "You know, Craig, that, that, that that's that's my favourite thing you've done for this movie." And I looked at him, you know, I was really hurt, you know. I like ten notes in the piano is, is is the best thing I've done in this movie, you know. And he did love it, but just you can imagine the day before, like scoring up over Rona. Do you know what I mean? And they said, no, I just love it, it's just perfect. You know, I was like, bastard, thanks, cheers, mate. You know, I was like dying at night, you know, trying to get this thing together, and I, I, I just tinkled out a few notes. He went, it's the best thing you did. <laughs> Music was this huge component in the film, and we had invested a lot financially in the idea of a team of Nelly, Marius, Craig, and the process was expensive. But as we went on, of course, the musical ideas expand, and the needs expand, and unfortunately, the budget doesn't. Not only was it a big advance and an expensive project to get into, it got more and more expensive. The joke around the lot was that we were all the cult of Baz. And the cult of Baz included some of us in the music department, and particularly myself and Laura Ziffrin, who was the person who we worked on this together. And then there was the people in the post-production department, and all the people who sort of, after the film had been shot, were now the people managing the spending of money. And we were, you know, now there's nobody, nothing anybody can do to me anymore. So I will say that we were hiding money all over the place just because we believed in the execution of Bass's vision. Holy St. Francis. You know, Laura had this great thing, a zeitgeisty thing for, for popular tracks. And she was always saying to me, you know, Bass, you gotta hear this band called, you know, Garbage. And I was like, Garbage, is that a good name? We found the song, and I know Baz always loved the song, but we weren't sure where it would go. And Nelly just loved it and really believed that they would be a big artist. From the moment I heard Number One Crush, I just went, this is perfect. But the problem with it was, it was a perfect piece of music that commented on the film. But as with the example of us, it being operatic form, where it needed, the comment that it made was too late in the film. There was no way of introducing it as a major early thing. And this is where Marius and, and Craig and Nelly really came to their fore because they didn't even blink with the idea of, you know, getting the masters and stripping it down. And in the end, we sort of subconsciously layered the song into the film so that it was almost like a ghosted whisper you know, I would, I could die for you. I would die for you. I would die, for you, which is, was, you know, so opposite that that lead vocal on its own became something that we fed through a, a, a sequence of reverbs and made it very ghostly. And every now and then you'll hear that just sort of tickling around the edges of the soundtrack. For example, when, um, Juliet goes to confession. If you listen carefully, there's, there's that garbage truck just, just there in the background. I long to die! I do spy a kind of hope which craves as desperate. 
desperate an execution as that is desperate which we would prevent. We assumed, everybody, that the garbage track, number one crush, was going to be the first single. It smelled like a hit, tasted like a hit. Um, they were right at the exact right place in their career to have a hit from a movie like this. Aesthetically, the record feels like this movie. If you sort of laid them side by side, they feel like they go together. Um, it was the perfect, it would have been the perfect single. And Phil Costello, who was head of radio promotion at the time, was very smart in servicing that record. Because what he did when he serviced that record to radio was instead of picking out a single, which of course we didn't have the single rights to anything, we did not have single rights to that garbage song. Which was a horrible blow, we all thought. He serviced the whole record. Um, and Garbage was the first song on the record. It exploded. Radio responded. It, the, it was on track to actually be the biggest record in Garbage's career. It wasn't just successful. It was a smash. Capital was, you know, was sort of taking the position that they were just getting out of the way, that they weren't doing anything affirmatively or aggressively. They were really just, the record was happening on its own, organically. I don't think Capital really knew what they had. They really didn't. And um, they, especially when Garbage caught on, they, I think they were absolutely swept off their feet. Come, gentle night. Come, loving black brown night. Give me my Romeo. Filmmaking is all about escalating levels of pain. The shoot is, is physically very demanding. Uh, and then post-production is psychologically very demanding. Um, but it, it kind of hits this crisis point, which is the studio announces a release date. And once you've got a release date, everything has to lock into place. Everything has to be finished. Everything has to be committed to. So all the things that you've experimented with or tried out along the way, they're either in the film or they're out. You write the music, you record it, and then you mix it. And you put it in sort of a, an easy digestible package. We were really up against it. We were moving towards the final mix, and we flew, Anton Monster and I flew to London, and we had but a few weeks to come back with every single final note that was going to be in that movie. My memories of, of, of the mixing, I have to say, are a little bit blurred, um, born almost entirely of sleep deprivation. The London mix was very intense. We were not just mixing the music, we were recording it, playing it in live to picture. Things were evolving in the music right up to the very last minute, which is uh, quite unusual. It was dark, um, no windows, and for 22 hours a day, there was stuff happening. There was a constant supply of sort of bit part, you know, guitarist coming in to do stuff. You know, you had, you had Baz and Nelly and me and, you know, the rest of the team and Maz and Craig and sort of sitting around watching film and building cues live to picture, which is something that I had never seen before or since. It was uniquely the way that this team worked together. When you think about the way that we made it, it seems kind of odd that the whole thing would be, um, has this feeling of unity that it does because it seems like it was a hodgepodge of a bit of this and a bit of that but actually because we kind of kept coming back to what we'd done and layering new elements and it was like we'd get an element of something and Baz would go well I love what that did in that scene there can we have that same wailing guitar noise somewhere else I remember being in a cab with Marius and he's like if you told me that you know in three weeks that I was going to be releasing a double album, I would just laugh at you. That there was just no possible way. And yet, that's what we're exactly we're doing. There was too much to do. I mean, there's always too much to do. But on this particular occasion, because of the way we were creating it, there was a lot more to do than there would normally be. It got very intense. You know, there was one period where Jeff and I were up for two and a half days without any sleep, just trying to feed, feed cues into the 
into the tub at the very last possible stage. But certainly towards the end, I don't think anybody left the studio for the last three days. It was just, we stayed. Really to watch those guys um, um, do this together, score a movie sort of before your eyes, uh, was very cool. In operatic structure, we've talked about the idea you have overture, and then you set up your musical themes, boy, girl, love, tragedy, you know, comedy, so on and so forth. At a certain point, no more new music. So now, as the story in parallel to the story's tragic evolution, you start to take all those themes, mix them all up, manipulate them, clash them, deconstruct them, so that they reflect the, the, the volition towards the final tragedy at the end. So you see Romeo desperately trying to get back to Juliet when he gets inside that bolted church door. Bang! And that's that same fulcrum point as, as when you first meet Romeo. All of the complexity and the polyphony is just sucked out of the thing. But, but the same thing is happening with the story, you know? This is the moment where the artifice and all of the heightened theatrical devices which are so important to the body of the film, are, are stripped away. They don't belong anymore in what's happening. What it is is, is you're, you're reduced to the simple story. There's a boy, the girl, and death. And now, we do introduce a new piece of music. It's a very Karecki like choral church music. And it shows Romeo making his way ever so slowly down the aisle of the church towards Juliet, who's on the altar. Concluding the story, once both the lovers are dead, that was a very big journey a very big decision. But Romeo and Juliet takes us back to early myths like Pyramus and Thisbe, and, and most particularly Tristan and Isolde. And so it seemed a very appropriate way to end their story by taking a piece of Wagner, Tristan and Isolde, and end their story by ascending into the heavens. Part of the clue of the film is how the film ends with the Tristan and Isolde. I mean, I think that sort of as a subtle wink to the people who want to study the music in the movie is like, really, this is Wagner, and we're coming out of that tradition, which is so over the top, passionate, and crazy. He wrote this beautiful, romantic piece of music. But what we really needed was a poem. What we really needed was a melancholic poem. And we 
approached Tom York of Radiohead to write something. And you know, I chased him all around the world. I must have, I used to ring him up, I was on tour and you know, he'd be in the middle of something. But it really seemed like we would never get this track. And we were literally, literally, literally in the last minutes of the mix. And this dad arrives and said, from Tom to Baz, hope you liked it. We pop it in and out pours this melancholic piece of poetry. From your sleep. It was immediately apparent that this was an absolute masterpiece and, and we were very, very lucky to be, to be offered it. What I took away from that film more than anything else was this idea that you can't let go. You have to push it one notch further because when you do, you get something special. And he certainly, you know, got something special out of us. Um, and I think, you know, we've all gained from it. I have to thank the music team, which is Nellie Hooper, Marius DeVries, Craig Armstrong. did do well and the film was I think you know, the masterpiece that people recognize it for now these songs are used in incredibly emotional moments and in emotional ways in the film so that when you play the record you think oh, I remember that feeling not even that scene just the feeling so the soundtrack just glowed in a way I can't even Explain. It's one of those soundtracks that just it sort of throbbed with, with its own life. You almost want to say, I wonder if someone could make a movie like that now. And of course, you can because Baz did Moulin Rouge, <laughs> which was you know, Romeo and Juliet times 10. But very, very few people are actually taking those sorts of chances. Through the fact that Shakespeare just focused on telling story and he used whatever he could to convey that story. And when it came to music, he used whatever music he could and he wasn't judgmental about it. It forced me to let go of my judgment. It forced me to be open to every kind of musical form. And for me, I guess that's the power of Shakespeare. It's the way he manages not only to bring all forms of music together and all forms of theater together, he manages to bring all kinds of humanity together.